try to limit my time on this a little bit today by limiting the topic. I appreciate your patience. Pam and I have been out of town uh, for much of the last, really, uh, six weeks or more, um, traveling around the United States. On the most recent trip, we were able to go down to uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, spend some time with family and friends. Also had the opportunity to speak at Liberty University Law School on October 27th. That talk was not recorded, but I'm going to talk a little bit today in this so the update that I'm doing called The Great Narrative about some of the things that I talked about. I know that there are some uh, people who have expressed concerns about Liberty, and uh, as you know from updates that I've done in the past, I, have shared the, I share those concerns. I do think that there are people within Liberty that are trying to change things, trying to get things, the ship righted. They do have, have had a change in administration. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But I decided to go ahead and speak. I was not restricted in any way about the things that I could talk about. And I just thought it was a, a good opportunity to to go and, and speak to the law students there. And some of them reaffirmed that uh, they had not really heard uh, much talk about Bible prophecy and that sort of thing, uh, either in their undergraduate or in their law school career. So I, I just thought it was a good opportunity to do that. Had a great time with the people there. Also got to uh, spend uh, the better part of a, a half a day with uh, Dr. Randall Price, who's in the School of Divinity there. Some of you may recognize the name. He's written a number of great books. The Rose, uh, contributed to the Rose Guide to the Temple, also, Jerusalem and Bible Prophecy. Uh, I think he has a book out on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He also has a book out about what do we do with the modern state of Israel, all, that I would all of which I would highly recommend. He also gave us a private tour for a few hours of the biblical artifacts that they have there at the library at Liberty University. I highly recommend if you're ever in the Lynchburg, Virginia area that you go and uh, go through that uh, museum and collection. Uh, there are things in that collection, I won't really talk about them today, I probably will at some other time. Uh, there are things in that collection that don't exist anywhere else on the planet um, due to, well, I just won't go into it. There are some things there that are pretty amazing discoveries from an archaeological standpoint um, that are very unique and memorable. So just a reminder, some of the places that we put this up, uh, I'm going to try to post this to Rumble. I'm not sure uh, how soon I'll get it done. Um, we've been having trouble, uh, as I think a lot of some other ministries have uh, said, they've been having trouble streaming to Facebook. Uh, so right now we're streaming on YouTube. There's some things I don't really talk about that much just because I think that we want to keep the channel open for the Bible teachings and sermons that we do in addition to the prophecy update. So I, there are some things I just won't talk about because you'll get flagged on YouTube pretty collect quickly. So we talk about, as you know, the convergence of events and the things that are happening all around the world. They seem to be happening with uh, stunning speed. I probably downloaded probably 2,000 pages of different reports and intelligence assessments, defense assessments, things from the Institute on Study of War while we were on vacation and read through a lot of it. And as a result, I just have a massive amount of information. I, I could easily go for hours with this. But today I'm going to try to limit it to the issue of artificial intelligence, technology, technocracy, transhumanism, and some related issues. I think they're all, everything is related. I'm going to do a separate update in a day or two on uh, the Middle East. So let's look at this. Now one of the things I talked about at the uh, Liberty was a little bit of this sort of grid and framework that I've developed over time called uh, the Prophecy ACLU. Uh, a for acceleration means things that are related to Bible prophecy just seem to be happening at an increasingly uh, rapid rate. It's is most people that watch and follow this will always tell you that it's very difficult to keep up 
related to that is the convergence of things. All of these different lines of Bible prophecy, whether it's the setup for the beast system, the, the seals of revelation, things are going to happen with regard to the trumpet during the period of the trumpets and then the bowls. All of those things are going to be happening at some point. They're going to be happening at the same time. Uh, my view of the seals is that the seals start, uh, when the seals start to open, they open and the first seal will increase in intensity over time. Second seal, third seal, fourth seal, the same way. Uh, it's not that the first seal happens and then everything associated with the first seal has to finish before the second seal opens. I just don't view it that way. Now, you're, as I'm sure there are people that uh, disagree, but there is a convergence of these events that happen uh, and so when you add the acceleration the convergence it can be very daunting to try to pay attention to everything that's going on uh, the third thing that i look at is logistics i've mentioned this in with regard to for example the ezekiel 38 39 war that we see coming uh, we have some details there one of the details is that it will be a great company and a mighty army I don't view the 50 or what Hezbollah claims as 100,000 fighters in Lebanon as a great company and a mighty army yet. I think there are some additional things that have to happen. And we see a lot of these things, and I'll talk a little bit about that more when I get to the Mideast uh, update that I'm going to do in a day or two. And then finally, we also know that as we get closer to the time of the end, we will get understanding. I've used the example of the eye chart. When I take my glasses off at the eye doctor, this is this is a, a nice version of what I see in terms of an eye chart. But as, even without my glasses on, as I get closer to the eye chart, I get a better understanding. And there's passages in Scripture that tell us that these things are going to happen. For example, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So as we get closer to the end, we're going to have a little bit better, not a little bit better, we're going to have a much better understanding of how all of these things are going to work out. We, we do have the basic parameters but exactly how it happens and exactly how it all fits together, uh, I think is uh, something that we'll, we'll know eventually. We'll be able to say, yeah, this is that which was prophesied by the prophets. But I don't think we're at that stage yet. So what I talked about at Liberty, what I want to talk about today is this thing related to the Great Reset. As you know, uh, this Great Reset is something that uh, the World Economic Forum has talked about. Uh, Klaus Schwab actually did a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset, in which he talked about how the Great Reset could be an opportunity for government and business working together to bring about massive change in society. And there's no doubt that over the last two years now, almost that we've been involved with this COVID-19. There has been a lot happening. The, the world has changed dramatically. The pandemic represents, this is what Klaus Schwab said, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future. And this has been picked up on by world leaders. For example, we have um, Anthony Guterres, who's recently got another term as the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, Time Magazine covered the Great Reset. Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada talked about the Re Great Reset. And of course, when uh, those of us in the Bible prophecy community put it out immediately, newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times came out and said, no, 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 it's not a great, it's not what you really think. It's really not that big a deal. But here's Time Magazine making a big deal of it with a cover talking about the Great Reset. And so this Great Reset is happening. In many places in the world, governments are taking advantage of the pandemic to reset and completely reshape their society and government. For example, uh, this is an article from Australia. Uh, Victorian Bar, the, the legal community of 
the state of Victoria in Australia has come out and spoke against what they call the appalling new pandemic laws that the premier of that state, a guy named Dan Patrick, who I view as a psychotic lunatic, who has put in that essentially gives him unlimited emergency powers to do almost whatever he wants. He can clear, declare a pandemic even when there's really not any disease around. Uh, now, it hasn't fully passed yet, is my understanding. It still has to go through one of the houses of the legislature there. But uh, if you watch the videos that are coming out of Australia, they're just absolutely appalling. And you wonder is, what happened? How did they let this happen? Another thing that's happened, this is a, a, an even a, a recent thing that I just found in the American Spectator yesterday, uh, that a copy that was sent to me. And here is a uh, talking about Dan Patrick. In fact, the Spectator in their article uh, talks about that now they call they refer to Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, as Dan Andrewstan, uh, or they call it Victopia, uh, because of what they're trying to do. So it is it, it's very very. I guess I would say shocking. Here, just listen to some of this. Uh, Daniel Andrews is not a state premier so much as he is an engineer, a social engineer who is using the office of premier to impose his worldview on a depressed and dispirited populace. While punch drunk Victorians are still getting their heads around the controversial pandemic management bill, which is currently before Victoria's upper house, dictator Dan is already salivating over his next assault on their freedoms. In the lead up to Christmas, Daniel Andrews has nothing if not a superb sense of timing. The state parliament is expected to vote on legislation that will severely curtail the religious freedom of Victorians. And why not? What else is a tyrant to do when he has already locked citizens in their home, shot at them with rubber bullets, fined their children for not wearing masks, and expanded his powers to the point where even Xi Jinping would blush? The, what they're referring to in this article is a proposed Equal Opportunity Act, which will essentially prevent Christian organizations, religious organizations, from hiring people who do not, they, they will not be allowed to not hire people who do not hold to their statement of beliefs. What they will do is they will... Um, what they say is, well, if they're teaching, for example, if it's a school, a Christian school, if they're teaching religion as defined by this psychotic lunatic, then they can hire somebody consistent with their state of, of beliefs. But if they're teaching math or pol political science or social studies or health or something like that, well, that's not religious, according to this guy. And... To the, under the proposed legislation, they will not be allowed to do that. Uh, it says this, this is the Spectator Australia article, under, Dan, and under Andrew's equal opportunity legislation, they will face what is being called an inherent requirements test, a measure that will re remove this right unless the school is looking to employ a principal or a religious education teacher. In other words, unless a teacher at a faith-based school is specifically teaching the faith rather than, say, math or geography or history, the school cannot specify that the teacher must be an adherent or at least supportive of their particular faith. It seems like, and I agree wholeheartedly with this statement, it seems like Daniel Andrews fundamentally misunderstands the nature of religion and religious education. Religious faith is not simply taught, it is lived out. But you see, Daniel Andrews lives out his secular religion and imposes it on everybody else. So maybe he understands the nature of the religion and he is like other people of the left who have these totalitarian leanings. He is trying to completely change religion because he wants his religion to prevail. Uh, this is very troubling. And what you see with these... I don't know what else to call them other than tyrants. Uh, for example, here's a statement I've played before from Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, about how she is to be consulted and nobody else with regard to 
issues related to the pandemic. Here's what she said earlier this year. The most up-to-date information daily. You can trust us as a source of that information. Uh, you can also trust the Director General of Health and the Ministry of Health. For that information, do feel free to visit at any time to clarify any rumour you may hear, covid19.govt.nz. Otherwise, dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. We will provide information frequently. We will share everything we can, uh, everything you are, else you see, um, a grain of salt. Uh, and so I really ask people to focus. The most egregious example of that appears to be this text which originated in Malaysia and has kind of a, has become a viral hope in Australia and in New Zealand. How irresponsible is it the people that are sharing that news of a lockdown imminent in New Zealand? Yeah, and, and look, that's the kind of thing that adds um, to the anxiety that people feel. So I continue to share the message. New Zealanders must prepare, but do not panic. Prepare. And, and when you see those messages, remember that unless you hear it from us, um, it is not the truth. And I really am. So there you have it. I, I think this is one of the most um, arrogant statements I've ever seen from anyone at any time in history. Uh, she is a tyrant. Uh, so now I know I probably, at least while she's in power, will never visit um, Australia. And remember, we've talked about this, about the, the World Economic Forum website, um, the Great Reset. This used to be on their website, but it's for some reason been taken down. Uh, there's certain topics harnessing the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the uh, restoring the health of the environment. I'll talk about that. In fact, I'll talk about that. Uh, was the uh, what occurred in Glasgow, Scotland is actually occurring as I speak in Glasgow, Scotland. It's a two-week event. Uh, they had thousands, tens of thousands of people come in from this. Uh, the largest delegations, by the way, to the climate, uh, the COP twenty-six conference in Glasgow was uh, the United States followed by Israel. I think Israel had 144 in their delegation that attended this, this nonsense. Uh, and you can see here that it's, it's not just about the climate. I think the climate is almost a uh, misdirection to get you focused on their crazy claims about the climate. Uh, here they say, destroy the patriarchy, not the planet. The wrong Amazon is burning. Climate action now, are you breathing? Thank a tree. I mean, this was uh, has been a, a week and a half long now event of just uh, a lot of people making grandiose claims and just lying about what they're going to do. They, you know, we're going to, here's cash for the world's rainforest. Well, people have pled, pledged $100 billion. Some countries, I think the United States, that, that money's never uh, come about. Uh, uh, Prince Charles, I'll talk about him, who spoke at the same time. And I want you to know that this climate change thing is part of this great reset thing that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, the other thing they're doing is they're redesigning social contract skills and jobs. They're completely changing corporate governance. Uh, they've gone to ESG, environment, social, and governments. They're now doing a, pushing a thing called stakeholder capitalism, which is really a form of socialism, so that the um, shareholders of the corporation are not necessarily the ones who have control of the corporation, it's the stakeholders, anybody who might be affected or impacted by the corporation, they now have a, a part in this. And you can see here, you know, human rights, justice law, gender parity, fourth industrial revolution, LGBTI inclusion. Uh, all of this is part of a piece as they're trying to really tear down and replace everything. Now we've talked a little bit in the past. Uh, I would highly recommend. I'm gonna what I'm gonna do here, rather than discuss a lot of these articles, is I'm gonna refer you to some resources that I think you should uh, look up if you want to learn more about this. This is a, a Mises Wire, a Mises Institute. I believe it's out of Austria. Um, 
it's uh, leans libertarian, uh, but they have at least uh, as of November second. This was part six of their series on the Great Reset, and they talk about the plans of a technocratic elite. So I want to talk about that a little bit because this is this is part of how they're implementing this Great Reset. Now. Go back to what I talked about in ACLU, Acceleration Convergence Logistics and Understanding. Logistics, we know that when these, for example, the mark of the beast system comes about, there will be an infrastructure that will surround it. Uh, as I look at these things and, and read more about this, I, um, I don't think we know exactly how this comes about, but we can certainly see that they've made uh, massive advances in implementing a beast type system. I and mean, we already have people in some states who are being told that you can't go shopping, you can't go out to eat, you can't do these things unless you have the state approved treat treatment for Charlie Vector 019. -er. It's just a matter of fact. Um, interestingly enough, I we went. Um, I think some of the apparel that you're supposed to wear as a prevention for Charlie Vector 019 er I don't remember a place we went uh, other than in Columbus, Ohio a couple times where I've had to wear that piece of apparel. I think you know what I'm talking about. But this, uh, this article that at Mises Wire, Mises Institute, is quite good. Um, the article says this, just to read a paragraph or two, the specific applications that make up the fourth industrial revolution are too numerous and sundry to treat in full, but they include a ubiquitous in internet, the internet of things, the internet of bodies, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, material science, energy storage, and more. And when you also look into this, understand that back in 2015, China came out with the Made in China 2025 goals that they had. Uh, and by the way, the Xi, the leader of China, has now come out. He is a full-blown, in-charge dictator citing his love for Mao. I, I do not understand how anybody can trust this man. Uh, with what he's doing when he's citing Mao as a great leader, a, the, a man who probably killed, I think, depends on who you have to the estimate, anywhere between 40 and 100 million Chinese during his different reigns of terror that he had. Um, so here we see that this great reset is coming and it's going to be technocratic elite that are going to implement this. So I'm going to go through some examples that we have. We, we talked about this. Uh, this is from back in 2018. Uh, Yaval Harari, uh, professor at the time, I don't know if he still is, a, a medieval history professor at Tel Aviv University. University. Uh, pretty sure he's an atheist. He lives with his partner. Uh, he's written some books on this topic. One is... Uh, I can't remember the title. Homo Deus, I believe. Uh, he's written two books. He's sold 35 million copies of these two books. That's almost, I mean, that's that's something uh, very few books sell like that. Uh, but for him to have two books that sell 35 million copies. So he's a very well-read author. Uh, he talked in 2018 at the Davos conference about will the future be human? And look at the imagery that he used in some of the graphics of his of his talk. Uh, he referred to the supercomputer. He's written articles for the uh, Economist talking about the world after coronavirus, what it's going to look like. And he talks about the fact that these this is a we have global problems, and it can only be a globalist solution to 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 reach these, to, 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 achieve, to solve these problems. And as he said in this article in The Economist earlier this year, humanity needs to make a choice. Will we travel down the route of disunity 
or will we adopt the path of global solidarity? If we choose disunity, this will not only prolong the crisis, but will probably result in even worse catastrophes in the future. So you see how they're building this up. They have this, if, if you don't go along with the implementation of this global system, this technocratic system, then you were going to have even worse catastrophes. So they have this apoc so they have their prophecy in their religion. They they have their uh, view of the apocalypse. He, he is a globalist, he is an atheist. And while I think he's a good thinker and he addresses some of these things in a in a way that not many other people are addressing them in terms of the potential problems, it's also clear that <coughs> It's also clear that um, I, you kind of think he's in on it in the game. So one of the way they're implementing this now is these vaccine passports, which are coming into use. They're Israel, other places, uh, for example, the United Arab Emirates, and their push for technolo technology and rally, really intrusive surveillance of their leader is... Uh, implementing these vaccine passports. This is very concerning. So when I look at the Abraham Accords, while we all like to have peace and cooperation, need to understand that there is a, a heavy technology and economic component to these Abraham Accords. And as I understand what's going to happen in the future, I'm very concerned about that, and I think people are missing out. These vaccine passports are actually, they're being implemented in different places. Everything is going digital. So here, for example, is uh, My Colorado. It's a, a mobile app that they have, and it includes, you can see there, the third one from the left, access the Col Colorado Smart Health Card as a secure digital version of your COVID-19 immunization records. So... This is being implemented. I think even Mississippi is coming out with a uh, implementation of this. Now, the science behind this is uncertain. This is a Bloomberg Business Week article from uh, back in March that not sure the technology is there yet. But all of this is being implemented. And now here comes the World Economic Forum. And this is sort of where I got my title for this update, The Great Narrative. In uh, a couple days, November 10th through the 13th, and you'll probably be able to watch it on the World Economic Forum website or their YouTube channel, they're having a conference in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates called The Great Narrative. And look at what it says. This is what uh, Klaus Schwab thinks. I mean, you know, if you really want somebody to play the part of... Uh, the bad guy, this guy really, he comes right out of central casting. But here's what he said, the great narrative initiative and meeting in Dubai will be a powerful catalyst to shape the contours of a more prosperous and inclusive future for humanity that is almost more respectful, that is also more respectful of nature. So you see how he ties in different things. He ties in the inclusion, the equality, and nature, you know, the global warming, the climate change aspect of all of this. Uh, here's some other things that are said. The World Economic Forum will hold their Great Narrative Meeting. The Great Narrative Meeting is a linchpin of the Great Narrative Initiative, a collaborative effort of the world's leading thinkers to fashion longer-term perspectives and co-created narrative that can help guide the creation of a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable vision for our collective future. So here they bring in all of the technocratic uh, dreams that they want to have. Sustainable development that comes out of the youth that's been, it was Agenda 21, now it's a, a Agenda 2030, or Sustainable Development Goals. So all of this stuff is coming in. So you see what they're doing is, as I've mentioned with regard to some of the political conflicts in, in the United States, they're creating this narrative. And this narrative, I think, is what's part of what's going to give the, is the foundation for this beast system that's coming.
Look what else they say. Top thinkers from a variety of geographies and disciplines, including futurists, scientists, and philosophers, will contribute fresh ideas for the future. Their role, reflections will be shared. Now, everybody's got a book. Here comes another book. We should be shared in a forthcoming book, The Great Narrative, expected to be published in 2022. And we live at this time where they're trying to change the narrative on everything. Here's our State Department. I'm going to bounce around a little bit back and forth with some ideas, but I think they're all of a piece and they're all related to what they're trying to do. So here's an article from the New York Times, U.S. issues first passport with X gender markers. So somebody has a passport now that has X for their gender. Uh, actually issued for this guy in and his surname he goes is ZZYYM. Um, it should be YYYYYY, but and nevertheless that's what he chose. Well, I, so I show my um, insensitivity by referring to him as he. Um, and here it is. There's the article or the announcement from the State Department there, and of course the oh, Biden administration is quite um, proud of that. So they have this um, probably a little bit out of order, but I saw somebody post that. I thought it was a great article. You know, the four horsemen of the, oh, really now the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, war, famine, pestilence, death, and now misinformation. So we live in this time where we're, we're not getting the real facts about much of anything from the media. Now, while we were out of town, we were actually in Virginia uh, in the days leading up to this election. Uh, and we can all be glad about the election that uh, Terry McAuliffe was defeated. Hopefully his political career is over. He came out and said, you know, parents should have anything to do with raising their kids. Uh, Youngkin, the, the change from how Virginia voted just uh, last year, <laughs> A year ago was dramatic it was a huge change part of it related to the I don't know if it's accurate to say the teaching of critical race theory in schools but the implementation of the ideas that come out of critical race theory maybe that's the best way to say it because you know they'll go interview somebody and he'll say, "Well, I don't know what critical race theory is," and they'll say, "See, these people are voting about things. It's just racist dog whistles that they're doing." That's what Terry McAuliffe said, and the response to that is baloney. But here's how the here's how the mainstream media responds to the issues in the um, Virginia election. Look, they're gaslighting people. They're they, you know they they're saying, well, "No, no, you you." you don't believe your lying eyes. Believe what we tell you is the truth. Here's what they say. We do not teach critical race theory here in Virginia. It has never been taught. We should say over and over that critical race theory is not being taught in schools. CRT is not being taught in schools. Never mind that it's fake. That's right. Critical race theory isn't taught. Critical race theory is not even taught in Virginia schools. Critical race theory, which is not currently taught in any Virginia public school. Something that's not even taught uh, in Virginia schools. To say that it's not taught in schools, CRT, that's not enough. It's really not on the curriculum in Virginia. Critical race theory not taught in Virginia public schools. Critical race theory is not actually being taught exactly. in Virginia schools. Even though it's not actually it's not taught real. anywhere, even though it's not a real thing. Well, there you see it. They're, they're all obviously reading from the same script. So I'm going to now play for you the um, what is actually going on in one major school system, Indianapolis Public Schools. Uh, an administrator here will tell you is critical race theory being thought? And I know a little bit about Indianapolis Public Schools. My sister was, uh, she retired about 10 years ago and passed away a few years ago, but uh, uh, she was one of the top administrators for a decade uh, in the, the main office at uh, Indianapolis Public Schools. But things have changed. I mean, they are teaching this, and this is what this administrator at IPS says. I'm the science coach and admin in the largest public school district in Indiana. I'm in dozens of classrooms a week, so I see exactly what we're teaching our students. When we tell you that schools aren't teaching critical race theory, that it's nowhere in our standards, that's misdirection. We don't have the quotes and theories as state standards per se. 
we do have critical race theory in how we teach. We tell our teachers to treat students differently based on color. We tell our students that every problem is a result of white men and that everything Western civilization built is racist. Capitalism as a tool of white supremacy. Those are straight out of Kimberly Crenshaw's main points, verbatim in critical race theory, the writings that formed the movement. This is in math, history, science, English, the arts, and it's not slowing down. If students of color have lower reading scores, it's because of inequity. Therefore, we take from the white students and give to the color students. That's Richard Delgado, straight out of CRT in introduction. All teaching is political, with reality and facts taking the back seat. That's Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, who outlined how she saw critical race theory flushed out in public schools in 1995. When schools tell you that we aren't teaching critical race theory, it means one thing. Go away and look into our affairs no further. It isn't about transparency, it isn't about cultural relevance, it's race essentialism painted to look like the district cares about students of color. We call it anti-racism, so you feel bad if you disagree with our segregationist pedagogy. It's taking advantage of kids' vulnerability and parents' inactivity to preen over social snake oil schemes designed to create division. Parents, when we tell you critical race theory isn't taught in our schools, we're lying. Keep looking. So and you can go and find on Twitter, you can find a number of other vid videos of people who are uh, in teachers in IPS who have come out and affirm what this gentleman had to say. But this comes into the church, too, in some ways, in this, the way this thinking is implemented. Here's an audio clip of Russell Moore, who used to be head of the ERLC, um, the Religious Rights Commission the Southern Baptist Convention. Former Democratic operative, uh, paid a lot of money to do this. And I want you to see how this is all part of building the narrative. So this is somebody who would claim to be an evangelical leader who comes out, and this is what he has to say about this issue. A pastor that I talked to recently, all he did was to pray for the family of George Floyd after the murder of George Floyd and has dealt with a backlash of his being a critical race theorist ever since. I mean, that sort of thing, it has gone down to the congregational level and to the family dinner table in a way that has really flipped a lot of the concerns. When 10 years ago, I would have parents concerned about their children leaving home and secularizing and losing their faith. Now, what I'm hearing are children, adult children, who are saying, what do I do with my mom and dad, who have become radicalized on Facebook? And you see, the reason why nobody who he claims is being radicalized on Facebook, the reason they don't come to him anymore is because they know that he's not worth talking to about this because he's completely adopted this social justice thing. This is just, uh, well, anyway, you can deal with that. Uh, front page magazine article by William Kirkpatrick uh, on November last Monday, the current chaos and competence are by design. And everywhere we see, we see this chaos. We see it, we see it in the schools, we see it in the economy, we see it in the way the elections are, are run. Uh, the, the, the narrative that comes out of the elections. And then, um, you know, we, we saw it in the election. So we had a great victory for Yunkin and Virginia. And by the end of the week, what did they do? A bunch of Republicans decided to vote for um, essentially a version, uh, a stripped down version a little bit of the Green New Deal. This is not an infrastructure bill or anything like this. This this is going to put in place structures that any administration coming in that opposes it is going to have a terrible time unraveling. Um, this is what this is what happened uh, to President Trump. He came in, and a lot of political appointees have been put in jobs where they couldn't really be fired, and so you were fighting the bureaucracy in addition to the political fight, you're fighting the bureaucracy. And this, so this is what this is trying to do. I, I don't understand why a Republican would do it. And they gave cover on this infrastructure bill to the uh, radical socialists, the squad, who voted against it. They didn't have the votes. It, would, it only passed because 13 Repu 12 or 13 Republicans decided to uh, capitulate to this nonsense. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, right now 
is we have, and I mentioned this a little bit, so I'm going to talk about the mandates for the state-approved treatment for Charlie Vector 019er, because I think this is a big issue. So the United States Department of Labor uh, has frequently asked questions about this treatment. One of the questions that they had, this was on the website, um, are adverse reactions to the state-approved treatment for Charlie Vector 019er recordable in the OSHA rec record-keeping law? And the answer is that yes, they, you would, if, if somebody took the state-approved treatment for Charlie Vector 019er and had an adverse reaction to it, because it was a uh, condition of employment, it was something that was required in the workplace, the employer was most likely, I don't think there's any question, required to record that and report that to OSHA, the Occupational, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. But what happened was that they decided, well, we're not really sure we like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this. So with regard to this particular treatment, so nothing else has ever, to my knowledge, has ever gotten this kind of treatment. So it says the recording requirements in question are not specific to this particular disease or to vaccines in general. Uh, they're required to do this, but what they're doing is that they're going to suspend that rec reporting requirement in this particular case. Here's what they say. This is a quote from OSHA's website. The Department of Labor and OSHA, as well as other federal agencies, are working diligently to encourage COVID-19 vaccinations. OSHA does not wish to have any appearance of discouraging workers from receiving COVID-19 vaccination and also does not wish to disincentivize employers' vaccination efforts. As a result, OSHA will not enforce this recording requirement to require any employers to record worker side effects from COVID-19 vaccination at least through May 2022. We will reevaluate the agency's position at that time to determine the best course of action moving forward. So do you see how this is all working together, excuse me, how this is all working together to create the great narrative about these things? and what you're supposed to think about them. This is an article from Bloomberg Law. Political views are not grounds for vaccine exemption. Now, I will tell you that I have been contacted by numerous people about this particular issue. I generally refer them to Liberty Council, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, First Liberty, and some of the other organizations that are handling these, and other churches that are... Uh, handing out the uh, vaccine exemptions for their members, a religious exemption. But you see right now here, it really should not be a choice as to whether the, your religious view is sincerely held. But they're opening the door for this. So this is an article, Bloomberg Law, that suggested, and it also cites the uh, very, very long uh, report from the U U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that says what you should know about COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and other equal employment opportunity laws. Here is a quote from the EEOC. The employer may ask for an explanation of how the employee's religious beliefs conflicts with the employer's COVID-19 vaccination requirement. Although prior inconsistent conduct is relevant to the question of sincerity, an individual's beliefs or degree of adherence may change over time, and therefore an employee's newly adopted or inconsistently observed practices may nevertheless be so sincerely held. An employer should not assume that an employee is insincere simply because some of the employee's practices deviate from the commonly followed tenets of the employee's religion. But you can see how they're kind of opening the door uh, for all of this. Now, what's also happened... Uh, is that the department, OSHA, has now come out with 
a standard and they're saying you know you have to be fully vaccinated by such and such a date if you work for an employer over 100 employees uh and so what they're saying you know they're they're looking at it the secretary can issue an emergency thing this is completely outside the scheme the statutory scheme and regulatory scheme that was set up for osha uh they're making this up uh this is well i'll tell you how one court looked at it uh in the initial stages in just a moment but so that says they have to find that there's a grave danger and there's two determinations employees are exposed to grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards <coughs> so this is what they're um, talking about COVID-19 vaccination and testing the emergency standard that's out and then that such emerging standards is necessary to protect employees from such danger. So this is how they're approaching it. Now, there has been, oh, I think 27 states, including some with Democratic governors, have filed suit or joined in lawsuits. This is one that was filed in the Fifth Circuit, Fifth Circuit to seek to uh, prevent the implementation of this plan. And the court said this. This is a quote from the Fifth Circuit opinion issued on Saturday uh, November 6th, because the petitions give cause to believe that there are grave statutory and constitutional issues with the mandate, the mandate, mandate is hereby stayed pending further action by this court. Now, the briefs were filed last night by the government. They were due uh, Monday night. The plaintiffs in the case, they have until this evening to respond. Uh, I've looked through this, and here is the official government response. Uh, well, here they say they're stayed pending further action. And so here is what the White House came out and said through their press deputy press secretary, uh, because Jim Pasaki, P Jim Pasaki Burger, Pasaki Burger, whatever his name is, is out uh, ill with uh, Charlie Vector, 019er. Or she tested positive for it, so she's in quarantine. And so they brought in... Uh, I guess the runner-up in the misinformation pageant um, to say this. And she said the White House on Monday said businesses should move forward with the requirements despite the court-ordered pause. This is part of the problem. I'm getting a lot of phone calls from people about this, um, that their companies are violating union contracts on it's something that should be part of the bargaining process they are just implementing it and they're implementing it regardless of whether osha has a rule or not or the, the federal government has a rule and this is what the so what they've done is they've they've trained everybody to do what they want without even having to enact a valid rule this is part of the problem and it's a very difficult situation i know of I've been contacted by numerous people who've lost their jobs uh pray for these people some of the people are finding uh, jobs pretty quickly but part of this is, all this is to get back to this vaccine passport thing and the implementation, I think, of a social credit system. Um, one of the companies that is putting out the state-approved treatment, uh, and everybody says it's free, but it's not free because they're pulling in, um, they sold 36 billion dollars of this this year and they forecast another 29 billion in 2022 which is way above what the annals that's just one company involved in this and look at this the american drug maker said yesterday that it was looking to sign more deals worldwide which would drive sales of the vaccine that it developed with BioNTech, its german partner even higher next year it has the capacity to produce 4 billion doses next year and has based its projections on sales of 1.7 billion doses. So there's a tremendous amount of money involved in this. And Pfizer came out with a, has now announced and it's been approved in the UK for use. They've come out with this um, early treatment bill our early treatment pill a therapeutic now some people use pfizer and then the last part of what one of the other 
what some people think is a therapeutic treatment. Pfizer, blank, blank, you can add, you can rhyme, use, make it rhyme if you want. So they, um, so that, and, and so now I think you're going to hear a lot about these therapeutics that the companies are developing, um, and now it's going to be okay to take therapeutics that are fairly new and are only going through the initial trials. Uh, just need to understand this, and part of this is to implement this social credit system that is being implemented everywhere. I talked about that in my talk in Canada called uh, "Deplatforming Humanity." Uh, it's coming to America. Now, at the same time that all this is going on, so we, we have this social credit system, we have this technocracy, we have this thing. Here along comes Facebook, and they announce that they are going to put in place the metaverse. So Joe Allen, you can follow him at JoeBot.xyz uh, on Twitter, and I think he's on Getter and some other platforms. And he refers to this and I think the appropriate term, he looks at this as sort of a religious thing that Facebook is pushing. The church of Facebook is set to capture the human soul in silicon. So this is, this is what's happening. Look at this. This is part of the video to introduce what's called the metaverse. It was just rolled out. I, I don't know if it was, it's, it's hard to remember when because time is so compressed right now. It certainly was within the last week. And here it comes. Uh, this is the rollout launch. And, and this is, I understand this is the real Mark Zuckerberg, but he looks like he's taken on the characteristics of a robot. Look at just a little brief clip of this. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually. It has things that are only possible virtually. And it has an incredibly inspired glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. By the way, while we're going by there, I would think that uh, this would be a good point to point out that we're, we are in a spiritual battle. This, this stuff is demonically inspired. And I just noticed this as I was watching this video again, that here on the left is a, a reminder to us Christians that we should put on the whole armor of God because of the spiritual battle that we're in. So thank you, Mark Zuckerberger, for bringing out some scriptural truth, which I don't think you do about, in your uh, little video parts of your physical home recreated virtually it has things that are only possible virtually and it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful hey are you coming yeah just got to find something to wear all right perfect <laughs> oh hey mark hey what's going on hey, Hi. Mark. what's up mark Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh -huh. Who made this place? It's <laughs> awesome. Right? It's from the crater. I met in L.A. Uh, this place is amazing. <laughs> Boz, is that you? Of course it's me. You know I had to be the robot, man. I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but there's something I got to get back to. All right, so that's a glimpse of a few ways that we're going to be able to get together and socialize in the metaverse. It's a ways off, but you can start to see some of the fundamental building blocks take shape. First, the feeling of presence. This is the defining quality of the metaverse. You're going to really feel like you're there with other people. You'll see their facial expressions, you'll see their body language, maybe figure out if they're actually holding a winning hand. All the subtle ways that we communicate that today's technology can't quite deliver. Next, there are avatars, and that's how we're going to represent ourselves in the metaverse well anyway you can you can see where this is going this is uh, very dangerous and this is operating on a theological level that is very concerning and i think it's all part of a piece and so we see these this is uh, an artist or architect's rendering of the facebook 
server farm in New Albany, Ohio, about 15 minutes from my house. It's actually not, that's not accurate because they actually built two additional buildings. Each of those buildings is as long as the Empire State Building is tall. And they're just filled with server farms. This is one, there's another one down um, east of Atlanta that they've built another and they're, they're in numerous places there are a number of places around the country and these are this is just facebook uh at new albany google spending somewhere around 2.3 to 2.5 billion dollars to build a server farm they are all to design to store this data that they're going to use to control things in the metaverse and they're just filled with rooms long long rooms full of these computers that are control, controlling data. Here's a report from the Wall Street Journal. Facebook increasingly suppresses political movements it deems dangerous. I mean, I see people all the time. I, I've got it on, interviewed on different shows. I've got a book coming out, and, and, uh, but you know, I can't advertise it on Facebook uh, or I can't advertise it on Amazon. And that's because they're con trying to control the information. They're trying to control the narrative. So now Zuckerberg has this utopian vision. And what happens when people try to implement these utopian visions? You know, there was a, 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 a film out a few years ago that Steven Spielberg did called Ready Player One. And these people lived in these, what they called the stacks. Actually, they, the stacks were located in Columbus, Ohio, uh, the area in which I live. And these people just sat around and did virtual reality all the time. But this is, this is incredibly dangerous to people's souls. So here's Zuckerberg doing his church of the thing. Um, there was something else I wanted to talk about. Well, so it's all part of the thing. And so this, the whole system is being designed and it, the, the existing systems are being torn down and new ones are being designed and implemented. So now we have, uh, if you've been to the store recently, you will notice that there's inflation. So. Uh, I'm sure that somebody from the Obama administration will come out and tell us why that's really a good thing. You need to understand why it's so great that you're paying $100 to have a pot roast dinner at your house now, at home, let alone going to the restaurant. Supply chains are breaking down. Uh, we noticed this as we were traveling around. Some stores are just having problems. At the same time, this there's been these meetings of the global elite. This is the G20 conference that took place in Italy in the run-up to the uh, Glasgow COP23. It's interesting how people are viewing this. These are, this is an editorial cartoon from the Times of London. Uh, and you can see how they're, they're viewing this climate change thing as this apocalyptic thing. Uh, here's an interesting one. This is the, that building from um, Glasgow is called the Armadillo. I didn't know there were that many ar armadillos. Shipbuilding on the Clyde. Why can't we trust? Why can't these people trust us to deliver? Is what's said by the leaders of this particular conference. Wild claims were made about what they were going to be able to do at the uh, the COP twenty three conference. I have an article from. Melanie Phillips. I won't read much of it. You can look it up. She's on Substack right now. Uh, if you just type in Melanie Phillips Substack, you can subscribe to her articles. And I want you to listen to, to Melanie. I think she's a good thinker. And she looks at what these people did. Uh, there was a very good, another editorial cartoon. And I'll finish with this in just a moment on COP26 in the London, the Times of London again, and you see how they portrayed this as this is the Tower of Babel type things that's going on. You see the armadillo be building there from Glasgow. You see the private jets. You see the limousines. I think at a climate change conference, uh, President Biden's motorcade was 85 vehicles, none of which I believe were electric. So. There's just a tremendous amount of uh, hypocrisy that's involved here. So Melanie has a great article on this titled uh, The Tragic Comic Climate Doomsday Cult. Uh, for example, here is uh, Naftali Bennett. 
the uh, junior prime minister, whatever he is, of uh, Israel, uh, with the what is it, four, five, six percent support of the members of the Knesset, uh, for him to be the prime minister. You had the young people, Greta Thunberg, and all these other people traipsing all over. Um, Glasgow protesting this and so Melanie says this what would happen if a doomsday cult were to take over the world science fiction no it happened how else to explain the collective lunacy of the COP26 meeting in Glasgow an absolute farce where world leaders made complete fools of themselves there's been much criticism of the hypocrisy of the event with hundreds of private jets flying into Glasgow to hector the world about reducing carbon emissions and the fact that no one in mainstream debate has challenged this as utter unscientific garbage well i skipped the sentence far far worse has been the total erasure of rationality in the historical course that this was the last chance to save the planet this is about the 20th last chance to save the planet but that's beside the point and as Melly says, and the fact that no one in mainstream debate has challenged this as utter unscientific garbage. Britain's Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said in his address, it's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock, and we need to act now. He pledged again to make Britain the Saudi Arabia of wind power. He said people were quilting the earth in an invisible and suffocating blanket of CO2, raising the temperature of the planet with a speed and an abruptness that it's entire that is entirely man-made now listen we know this this is what the devil does the devil creates the great narrative to explain away the biblical narrative so we know the biblical narrative is that there's these judgments coming on the world and they're coming from god but Satan is doing all of these different things to do away with this narrative. So the um, this is this is what's happening. There was a rather, I would say, bizarre speech given by Prince Charles. Uh, at COP26. I'm going to play a clip of it. I want you to listen carefully to what he says uh, because the, and I've, I've listened to it about 20 times just to make sure that I didn't misinterpret what he said or misunderstand what he said, where he talked about one of the ways to do this. And he was not very uh, appreciative of the ability of the world leaders to do this but listen to how he phrases it and he refers to a his there but there's no antecedent so my question is and others have raised this as well who is he talking about what what is going on here listen to what he says as we tackle this crisis our efforts cannot be a series of independent initiatives running in parallel. The scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global systems level solution based on radically transforming our current fossil fuel based economy to one that is genuinely renewable and sustainable. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector with trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect 
of achieving fundamental economic transition. Well, that's interesting. Who is the the his that he's referring to that has these trillions of dollars? It's very interesting. Now, I'm going to make just a few quick comments. Um, I'm not going to play this clip. I will do this in a future update. This is Yal, y Yaval Harari on 60 Minutes this past Sunday. You can go to the CBS website and you can watch this. I hesitate to play 60 Minutes because I always get these... Um, um, copyright strikes, especially for CBS. CBS and Oprah are probably the two most, uh, the ones that generate the most uh, copyright strikes. They're, uh, they're also some of the hardest to record and pull off uh, the internet. But this one was easy because they wanted to promote it. But he's talking to Anderson Cooper about humanity and hacking humanity, things that he's talked about at Davos. And what's going to happen? What's this going to look like? And what he says is that it has to be a global solution, but it's going to create more inequality than anything we've seen before in human history. And it may be only the elites that can afford this. And this plays into so many lines of the convergence of these lines of Bible prophecy. It's, it's insane. Now, I'm going to recommend a resource for you. Uh, Bannon's War Room, pandemic, War Room Pandemic. Uh, warroom.org you can find it on rumble you can find it actually on apple podcast as well they did a two-part series on saturday november 6th on technocracy transhumanism and that sort of thing uh, they had joe allen they also had on patrick wood who's been to um, uh, fbc to speak and did a conference and i reached out to him about coming back uh, Patrick is really a great researcher on technocracy, Joe Allen as well. But they looked at this in terms of this is this is a huge apocalyptic, very serious thing that's going on with transhumanism. That there's a religious component to this. Now some of the commentators that they had did not really and, and Patrick I don't think had a chance to weigh in on it, but this is this has this huge religious apocalyptic component to it and in fact uh, one of the commenters commentators said this is this is tower of babel type stuff and we're not sure how this t tower of babel thing works out now i'm going to refer you to genesis chapter 11 where it talks about what happened at the time of the tower of babel they wanted let's make brick and burn them thoroughly and they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar and they said come let us build us up a, build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth and the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built and the lord said behold the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do Come, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So what we see here happen, and remember that in Jewish way of looking at prophecy is that prophecy is often determined by historical fact patterns. So we, here we have this historical event at the Tower of Babel where God intervened because man had united together to raise themselves up to the level of God. I have, so if that's, that is a pattern for what will happen in the end time, that this Babel will be rebuilt in some way that it will be man trying to become God as God what happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 which is that God intervened and scattered the people, then the pattern will hold in the end time that God will intervene and judge the people for what they're doing. And I think we're in, we're in very, very dangerous territory. I think that we are at a point where, man, we need to be living for the Lord. We need to be sharing the gospel with people. We need to be 
talking to people and my my wife was talking to some people doing some work at the house yesterday and uh, bless her heart she was in a nice way she was all over these people about what they believed and what's happening and what's going on in the world um, and when they left the one guy said man you have a really smart wife uh, that's a very intelligent woman you married there and i agree but that that's an ex i think an example of how we need to be living I, I think we need to be talking about these things because listen you know even at liberty university there were some people that said you know i've never really heard anybody talk about this it's the time to be talking about this because this is a perfect avenue to open up people to share the gospel with them the hope that we have in jesus christ because all this and it can be distressing to watch all this supply chains inflation economic you know people coming after you because of your religion or because of what you won't do it it can be troubling but we know that we we know that this all works out pretty well for us but we need to share the hope that we have in jesus christ with those around us so thanks for listening i will try to put up an update in the next day or two that will focus more on geopolitics in the Middle East. God bless. Thank you.